Hello. Uh, welcome to another another en enthralling installment of my wonderful YouTube channel. Uh, so, before we get into this video, I would like to thank everybody who has subscribed to the channel. Which is a surprising number of people. 63 currently, as we speak. Which is um, more people than I think I've ever held a conversation with. So... That's pretty impressive. Uh, so, in order to honor that, I would like to make a special offer. This special offer is uh, applies to really any of my videos. Um, if you want to comment on one of my other videos instead of this one, but I, I don't know why you would. Um, but basically, what I'm going to do is the first ten people to comment and recommend me to review something. I will review it in the next video. That's the next video. That's the uh, special. That's my idea. So, I'm not just talking albums. I will review anything that you that you want me to review. I'll review fucking uh, a mop if you want. I don't know why you would want me to do that, but if you wanted that, I will review porn. I will review a book. I will review a movie. I'll review even a video game. I, I do not give a shit. Whatever you want, I will do it. First ten people. Though. I can't... Uh, I only have so much time. So, yeah. First ten people, I will... First ten people to comment. Whatever you, whatever you want. Um, reviewing porn on YouTube is going to be really fun. So I can't wait, to, can't wait to get to that if someone actually does recommend me to review porn. But I'll do it. I'm dedicated. I don't know why you want me to do that. You probably are just going to recommend me a bunch of albums. But anyway, whatever you want, I guarantee, I guarantee you I will review it. Unless it's illegal, in which case I will not review it, because that is a crime. Admit, I am not exactly a film person. I don't dislike movies or anything. In fact, I quite like them. I just don't spend as much time as I should watching them. Coming as a surprise to no one, though, pretty much the only movies I watch are horror or surrealist films. Growing up, it was all my dad would put on, and I loved that because a lot of those movies were great. And one movie my dad showed me was an unforgettable one. Not that others weren't, but this one stuck out and put me on a trajectory to have a very specific taste in movies. The Elephant Man is not a horror movie. It is very strange though. The Elephant Man was the first movie I ever saw by my favorite director, David Lynch. David Lynch is a man who makes some of the most interesting movies that exist. Most famous for his work on Twin Peaks, he has made numerous experimental and surrealist films that Despite many attempts, no one can seem to replicate the style of. There's often this attempt to explain and break down his films, and that completely misses the point. No one can explain David Lynch's movies. Hell, half the time he probably can't explain what's happening. And that's because it's not about meaning. It's about the journey, the experience, and most of all, the vibe. All of his movies have this vibe. You feel transported into this ethereal world that might be frightening, but also beautiful at the same time. An, an uncanny, anachronistic feeling. Like you're in the 1950s and the 3950s, all at once. And I mention David Lynch because, while filmmakers have tried and failed to replicate this vibe, musicians have been in touch with it since before he even made movies. No Wave is a genre classifier that was invented back in the 1970s. Often used to describe a lo-fi style of avant-garde punk music localized in New York. 
But as terms often do, it evolved. One of the most well-known and influential bands to emerge from the no-wave scene was Suicide. Suicide was not only one of the first electronic bands or one of the first no-wave bands. Suicide was one of the first bands to use the term punk music. In the year 1970, their music isn't quite typical of punk, but that's the idea of it. It's not typical. The term punk is often thrown around to simply mean fast music that's not quite metal, but it's more than that. It's an ideal. The idea that the music you are putting out into the world defies any expectation, and that's definitely what Suicide does. Founded in 1970 by Alan Vega and Martin Rev, they spent the first seven years of their career playing exclusively live shows. But it wasn't until 1977 when they released their first album that they started to gain notoriety outside the small New York live scene. This album sounds like nothing else released at the time. It still doesn't sound like anything you'd find today either. It's really quite strange. That's the only way of putting it. Throughout the album, there are pulsing, repetitive synth drum sounds and dissonant chords. The song Frankie Teardrop is probably their most infamous. It is 10 minutes and 26 seconds in length, and it has been dubbed by many to be one of the scariest songs of all time. This song really does fit the darker side of David Lynch's films perfectly. The claustrophobic, confrontational nightmare that you can't seem to break free from, no matter what you do. It follows a man named Frankie who loses his mind and decides to kill his wife and child, and then, of course, himself. Following this, he ends up in hell, and this is where the track gained most of its infamy. Alan Vega's vocals in this part, specifically representing the tortured screams of Frankie in hell, have often been described as inhuman, or horrifying, or screams. In 1977, this probably would have caused some people to genuinely shit themselves, believing that a demon had infected their stereo. Nowadays, it's not too bad, especially if you listen to a lot of metal or noise music, but it is still slightly uncanny. The atmosphere of the track is truly unparalleled. They do have some songs that are much more calming, one of which is my personal favorite of theirs, Surrender. This is a song that, while very melancholic, is extremely romantic at the same time. The phrase, I surrender to you, may be one of my favorite lines in a love song. There are more forms of lynching music than just no wave, however. Scott Walker is a very interesting story. Over the 60 years of his career, he has gone through so many stylistic changes that it's hard to really pin him down. In the, in the 60s, he spent his time in a pop trio, aptly named the Walker Brothers. Their music is certainly a product of its time, and they were extremely successful in the UK. But as they often do, creative differences tore the band apart, and Walker began his solo career. While his music in the beginning was still very pop adjacent, there was a darker tone to his lyrics and a much more produced Broadway-esque sound. Now, this wasn't enough for Walker. He wanted to make something new, something bigger and better than he'd ever done before. In 1984, he released the album Climate of Hunter, an album that sounds like it's from an alternate version of the 80s. The typical stylings of 80s pop is there, but there's something dark hidden underneath, and Walker's vocals add a strange feeling to any solo Walker track. This is when he began his spiral into the avant-garde. As where this album, I would say, is pretty accessible to fans of something like Joy Division or David Bowie's Stranger Works, his later albums are a completely different story. Scott Walker went from being a peaceful 1960s-style singer to making some of the darkest-sounding avant-garde soundscapes in existence. Tilt sounds like a soundtrack to a film where everyone will die by the end for no discernible reason. It's a tragic neoclassical journey. But I'm partial to his 2000s and 2010s work. It's... The Drift it was an album I've already discussed in my bizarre and disturbing album series. It's one of my favorite albums, sounding unlike anything else, uh, except for uh, his other albums. Bish Bosh is his most Lynchian album, I'd say. He had a slow downward spiral into darkness, and this is where I'd say it ends. The instrumentation is occasionally sparse, 
or non-existent, but other times it's so loud and oppressive that you wish it would go away. There are weird sounds that resemble screeching cars and windshield wipers. This album feels like it would go very, very well with the Eraserhead film from 1977, a movie with a similar sounding soundtrack. Constant moments of silence that sound just as loud as the impressive industrial noises. This album represents the fear and darkness that hides not so deep underneath the surface of David Lynch's films. While it's not exactly No Wave, in fact, it's not at all No Wave, the spirit is still within. In 2008, in Canada, a band by the name of Women was formed. This band had a very lo-fi sound, and a bit of a noise experimentation. They were a great band, but tragically only four years later the band member Christopher Raymer died and the band dissolved. If you like math rock akin to the brave little abacus or something like that, but you want something a bit more laid back, I would recommend checking out women. That is the only time I would recommend checking out women. But one of the members is more important presently. Patrick Flegel, I hope I'm saying that right, released the first demo under the Cindy Lee name in 2012. Cindy Lee is a difficult project to describe. It's not quite harsh noise, not quite rock, and not quite pop. This is the closest thing to a modern no-wave act that exists. The album Act of Tenderness is my personal favorite of the project. As soon as I heard this album, I immediately felt like I was in a dream. I felt as though I had discovered the secret musical career of the Lady in the Radiator. This music, while slightly abrasive, is beautiful. I don't know how to describe how much I love this album. It's weird and wonderful. I get this same feeling while listening to music in two other types of places. One is in my dreams, and the other is art museums. Now, when you go to an art museum, especially a modern art museum, there's this sense of unease, almost, that you have no idea what the fuck you're going to be seeing. It's this really strange vibe. It's like a smell, but there's no scent. An emotion I can't describe. This sense that what you're seeing does not belong that you do not belong, and that you've entered another world and are seeing things that you shouldn't be seeing. And what could be more Lynchian than being lost in a world where things are just slightly off? So I have something that could be more Lynchian, and that's gloomy jazz. Now starting with Blue Velvet, Angelo Battlementi, I really hope I'm saying that right, has been the composer for everything David Lynch has directed. And Battlementi has this distinct style to his music, an almost ambient style of noir jazz. Now while I could spend this whole video talking about his music, the point of this video is more to showcase musicians and other, other than Lynch and those who have worked for him that give this same vibe. Boren und der Club of Gore is a band that was formed in 1992. Their first album, Gore Motel, was described as an unholy cross between dark and ambient and jazz. The album Midnight Radio from 1995 is a perfect example of their sound. It's slow and methodical, as if you're following someone suspected of a strange, nonsensical crime in the middle of the night while thinking about every mistake you've ever made. It's perfect music for brainstorming, or relaxing, or ruminating, but it has this dark atmosphere that adds to the mystique. The band members originally played in doom metal bands, and it really shows here. I'll admit, I'm not that into doom metal. I, I, I like it, don't get me wrong. Funeral Doom kicks mega ass. I just haven't listened to much of it. But Born und der Club of Gore are the perfect example of doom jazz. And that's pretty sick.
I would like to end this video with another one of my favorite bands. I'm starting to notice a trend here. These bands that I love are very similar to the work of my favorite director. I suppose that shows of the mediums of film and music aren't as different as, I, as they seem. But I digress. It's a stereotype that Japanese things are ten times crazier than anywhere else. We have, they, they have anime, they have hentai, they have JRPGs, and they have crazy-ass movies. But one example that conforms to the stereotype was punk rock. Looping back around to No Wave, Japan had their own strange brand of it. In 1967, a band called Les Rallys de Nundes was formed on a college campus by Takashi Mizutani. They made some truly out-of-the-box music for the time, creating noisy, distorted punk tracks long before even the Ramones. It's hard to understate how important Les Rallys are. Their music really was ahead of its time. Some of it is slow and ballad-like, and other tracks are much faster and proto-punk styled. They also had ties to the Japanese Red Army. One of their members even hijacked a plane, and it's a long story, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. The plane hijacking story isn't what introduced me to its, this band, and it shouldn't be what introduces you if you aren't familiar with them. The music's uncanny beauty should be enough. The song White Walking is probably one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. There's something about it that just draws me in. I remember when I still used Spotify, I had three separate instances of White Walking on the uh, playlist that I used every day. And that would increase the chances of me hearing that song. Sometimes even twice in a row. And most of the time, I wouldn't skip it if it played twice in a row. That's how much I love that song. The rest of the album on the, that, that's from the Cable Haug soundtrack is incredible, and I highly recommend checking that one out if you have the time. It has this uncanny beauty, and uncanny beauty is the perfect phrase to describe Lynchian music. So that's the end of a yet another video. Um, I hope you guys like this one. I had a good time making it. I thought it was a pretty fun video to make, and you know, it's just it's just cool to talk about things, make connections to things that you wouldn't expect to be able to make connections to. Also, I really just like the music that I talked about in this video a whole lot. Once again, I'm gonna thank you guys for. 50 subscribers, but now we're not even, I mean, since it took me so long to make this video, we're at 63 subscribers now, which is just crazy to me. I'm really glad that this channel is growing at a decent rate, um, and I, I'm just, I, I'm, I appreciate everyone. I mean, I know people say that a lot, but it's much easier to appreciate every single person who subscribes to your channel when there's only 63 of them. I, 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 every time I see I get a new subscriber or someone likes my video or comments on them and I can see who they are, I want to go in and just check what they do. Because I just think that it's so cool to figure out all the different things about the people who enjoy your content. It's, it's just, it's really neat. I really like it a lot. So I want to thank you guys again. And if you have anything you want me to review. I'm going to repeat that. Anything that you want me to review, comment down below and I will review it because I just want to give back a little bit, you know. I am very grateful. So, yeah, comment down below what you want me to review and I will do it if you're in the first 10, which you probably will be because we don't get that many comments. So, yeah. Um, if you made it this far, thank you, of, of course. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't watched one of any of my videos before and you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. Uh, you guys have a good day, or a good night, or what a good, uh, whatever in between. 
and uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one.